I can't tell you how glad I am to be back here. I was here two years ago, and this conference literally changed my life. I will often tell people in the United States, like, this is the greatest conference nobody's ever heard of. I walked out of this conference last year and really understood the power of creativity, the power of just really what was going on in the industry, and went back and did something crazy. I've been writing a blog for like 12 years, totally got rid of that, and started doing a podcast called The Crazy Ones. And it really is about talking about all the things that we're here about, but it's also doing it in a way to talk about what are all the things that we don't say? What are the things that we don't talk about? And some of them are the right way to teach design thinking. Some of them are taking on really hard topics like the issue of gender bias in the design industry. So I think it's just, it's been a fascinating journey for me, and I'm incredibly glad to be back. But it's also why I wanted to talk today about the power of crazy, because one of the things for me is that I've spent too damn long in my career feeling like the outsider, feeling like the weirdo, feeling like the person that didn't fit in, to the point where I've literally marked my body to never do that again. So I have actually have the words, here's the crazy ones, tattooed on my right arm. Some days it's a reminder, some days it's, a, it's an affirmation. In either case, it's a great way to start a meeting so your clients know what it is that they're up against. But so, talking about when I started my design education, this is literally me starting my design education. So this is me at two years old, standing on the feed tray of the cast iron letterpress that sat in my parents' basement. My dad and I would go down there, we would write our own stories and then print them on this letterpress. So like, you know, children working with lead, it worked out great, it wasn't a problem. But the other thing that it did was that for me, I had an appreciation from design from such an incredibly young age because I was basically a hipster by the time I was four years old. Because I had been self-publishing my own storybooks for years and was incred incredibly confused about why the other children were buying theirs. So this is literally where it started. I went on to work in ad agencies. I've been a paid designer since I was 12 years old, which is literally the truth. So this is all I've ever known. But you know, an interesting thing happened. What happened was that I had American Airlines on as a client when September 11th happened. And I got to spend the next three and a half years trying to figure out how do you deal with a brand that has never gone through anything like that before in history. And what it led me to believe was to understand that for me, building a brand was a much more interesting conversation, a much more interesting problem than building an ad for a brand. So I confused all my friends, left the advertising industry. I spent nine years building the global brand design team at Starwood Hotels and Resorts, with some of the best work of my career. And then I spent the last two and a half years as the first head of design in the 210-year history of Citibank, because apparently I'm a masochist. But it's OK, you can laugh at that, it's good. Um, but here's the thing, like some of the proudest moments of my career, I think like this is the big credibility slide that I've got. Um, over my career, I've done a ton of work with Apple. My, like my work has appeared in 10 of their keynotes, four TV commercials, like it is the fulfillment of a lifelong dream like you just can't even understand. But so what I did was two months ago, again, confused all my friends to go work for a company called Envision. And Envision is really a 600 person startup that does not have an office, all 600 people work remote. And we're working to rebuild design tools for the digital space for modern creativity. One of the ones that we're about to launch is called Studio, which is a complete rethink of if you're designing apps and digital tools, how do you actually do this? How do you combine design with prototyping, with collaboration, all into one tool? And the really cool thing about our company is that whenever we do this, everything that we do is free. And it's free for forever. So you want to go out and you want to try it, you can do that. But so what I did was I joined as, because these are our clients. On day one, I get to work with 80% of the world's top 100 brands. It's an incredibly cool opportunity. But so, but here's the thing, was I joined as the head of design transformation, which sounds dangerously like an episode of Silicon Valley, or like one of these titles that somebody just makes up. We spent a month thinking it up. But what it really means is, you know, look, why the hell does my team exist? Why is this something that is actually important? And the reality is, is that, look, as an industry, I believe that we exist in a moment where creatives have the opportunity to change business in a way that we have not seen since the Industrial Revolution. As you look at the rise of design thinking, you look at the rise of a lot of these different things, we have the ability to sit at board tables and influence business in ways we have not seen for a really long time. The challenge that we're having is that most of us are wasting that opportunity. 
So for most anybody who knows me, I'm about honesty. So today we're going to do two things. One, we're going to be completely honest. And two, if we do this right, this probably turns into a little bit of a therapy session because a lot of what I'm going to say, there's going to be a lot of nodding, smiling, nudging each other, doing stuff like that. That's totally cool. But the, the purpose of my team really is to elevate the impact of design inside of every company, not elevate the design team, elevate the impact of design. So I get to go work with companies like Google and Twitter and Uber and all kinds of these really incredible companies to, for them to figure out how can design be more impactful. But so this is the thing, is that as an industry, what the hell keeps getting in our way? What are the problems that we keep running into that we need to overcome? I think there are three big ones that are holding us back. And as I talk to designers and creatives, these are the things that I see time and time again. The first one is this one. We keep wanting to treat design like it's art. What do we do? Because we're in an era of Pinterest and Dribble and all these sort of things where what we fetishize is how things look. Oh, it looks good. You know what? That's great. But we live in a time where we need to separate design from creativity. They are two different things. The value of what we all bring to an organization is creativity. Design is the visual expression of creativity. Everybody values creativity. Almost nobody values design. This is why this is a huge problem. So that we need to stop just fetishizing pretty. Like, look, I would love to be able to do this stuff. I'd love to be able to just put up something and not have a client, not have a budget, not have a tech team that's going to build it. I would love to do that. That's not the reality of what we do on any of this stuff. We need to do other things. Like, we love the beginning and the end of a story. We don't really want to talk about the middle. The beginning, the two guys in the garage that started the company. How great was that? The end, we had the big launch, and oh, this was so fantastic. I want to live in the middle. The middle is the fact that creativity is a blue-collar profession. It is a hell of a lot of work, and we need to start recognizing that and embracing the fact that this is a lot of stuff that needs to go on, and it's not just what happens at the end. But this is the other part of it. A lot of us don't want to learn business. I didn't want to. But business defines our success. And that that's the problem, is that in so many cases, with so many of these reasons, this is the thing, is that for people to see the value of what we do, we can't go in and just say that it's pretty and then not get why they don't understand us. But so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to try to change all of this. Because like I said, I've worked with every team that is out there. I've worked with senior teams at Apple. I was one of the first like eight outsiders that was brought in on, uh, from Apple to work on Apple Watch. So I've seen tons and tons of what holds people back. So we're going to have a bit of a therapy session to talk about how do you, create, how do you really inspire creativity and do more innovation in anybody. And what it's going to be is that there are going to be eight things that we're going to talk about. I only have like what? 12 and a half minutes left. These talks scare the hell out of me because there's a DJ who plays me off the stage. But this is the thing, right? So I have got eight things that we're going to talk about. The first one of these is that you need to have a process. And I know what you're thinking. Steve, you started with the sexiest thing possible. This is what every creative wants to hear about. Whenever we do creativity, what are we going to talk about? Damn it, we want to talk about process. I know that you don't. But here's the thing, is that you have to define what you need to be successful. I see way too many teams. I go in there and I'm like, okay, well, tell me your process. What do you need to be successful? They say, we need these three things. I said, okay, great, you need those three things. How many of those do you get on a regular basis? They're like, well, one. I'm like, so let me get this straight. You need these three things, you get one, and then you're not sure why you're not doing good work. Like, yeah, that's a mystery to me, right? But I think that's the problem, is that what we need to do is we need to stand up for what matters to us. We need to defend our process. We need to stop existing in this space. We're just going to take what people give us. That's not the way this works. What it works is, is that you actually need to go out and you need to define the things that matter, define the sort of things that you need to be successful. And like I said, I know this is the least sexy thing in the world, but it also is the thing that is going to set you up for the biggest success. From there, get a problem. This is the number one thing. Whenever I go into work with teams in companies anywhere in the world, this is what I see. And what I see is I see teams that get solutions to be vetted, not problems to be solved. What does that mean? That means that somebody in technology and product and, an ex and some executive comes in and says, we need this. I see this all the time, like a big part of my role I'll describe as executive hysteria management. And what that means is that there'll be a meeting. Some chief marketing officer will say, we need a t-shirt. All of a sudden, like, people are running around, agencies are being briefed, we're buying up companies, we're building t-shirts, we're, like, doing all this stuff. And it's, I love how everybody, like, so I tell people with their head down and laugh, like, you have no idea this has never happened to anybody here. But this is the problem. 
is that nobody ever stops to say, why the hell do we need this? It's like, oh, well, they said. It's like, okay, right. So let's get this straight. Either your team is a commodity or they're an asset. A commodity takes orders. A commodity just follows deadlines. Those are the ones that get laid off, they get ignored, they get overlooked. The ones that stop and ask why, the ones that make sure that they don't just get a problem to be solved, right? They, well, that's what they want, is they want this sort of thing where I'm like, don't just tell me what to do. Give me a problem and let me work through that. Respect my process. Understand the first idea you have is never your best one. It's like, it's great, Mr. Executive, you had this one t-shirt, but let's stop and ask them and say, did they mean a t-shirt? Did they mean that we need a customer touch point? What are these sort of things that we're gonna do that are actually going to make a difference? And how do we stop that just sort of like executive hysteria of like, okay, well they said that, that's what we have to do. We've gotta answer for more as an industry. This is our power, our power is creativity. Creativity changes entire companies because it lets anybody be creative and that's what's so great. Like about a couple of weeks ago, I got to go spend two days at Fisher Price. Go watch children, everyone is creative. Our schools, our society, our education, our jobs convince us that we're not. Because whenever you watch those kids, you see a superhero, you see a plumber, you see a little boy wearing a boa and heels, completely unrestricted. It's trained out of us. Everyone is creative. What they need is just somebody that can bring them back for them so that they can do that again. You have to be inclusive. This has been a shift in our industry because what it used to be is as a creative, what you could do is you would just say, well, look, you give us the brief and we're gonna go away. And then like the client would think we're off doing like a watercolor of our spirit animal while we wear a beret telling everybody about, you know, how you don't understand what we do. No, what happens is that you need to bring people into your process. As you've seen the rise of in-house design teams, as you've seen the rise of inclusion in this, this has been a massive, massive shift. This is why I see so many companies and agencies struggle because they still want to keep everybody at arm's length. That's not how this works. We need to bring people into our process because what we want to do is we want to take advantage of the base human psychology that people will support what they are a part of. If you think about it, where I'm gonna go through, do this process, have an idea, come something up, and then take it to them, what can they say? They say yes or no, and that's it. No, what I need is I need to bring them into that process, because in that case, I'm asking them to be a part of it, not to just simply approve it. So from there, you really have to expect that there are going to be problems. This always mystifies me, because what is it? It's this, is that most people think that creativity shouldn't have problems. That's all that creativity is. Creativity is getting a problem. I give everybody in here the same problem. I get however many people are in here's worth of solutions. Creativity is about having a lot of bad ideas on the way to having one good idea that we think that we don't hate, that we can work on as long as the time or the budget allows it, till at some point we have to abandon it even though we don't think that it's perfect, and so the point that we then have to move on because our client told us to. Right, like no projects are ever finished, they're just abandoned. That's the reality of this, but again, so to stop thinking that like having a problem is a problem, because I go to all these companies, and they're like, Steve, we're so worried, we don't know what to do, we're having problems whenever we're creating. It's like, great, you're doing it right. You're like, look, if you aren't doing these things, that's a big problem, because that's the thing, stop thinking that this is a problem. And this is the other part, whenever there is a problem, this is the thing that you have to make sure that you do, because most of the time what I see is when there's a problem, People don't come together to solve it. They don't bring everyone together to rally around the best idea. What they invest in is a lot of paperwork to make sure they don't get blamed. Again, if creativity has problems, you need to expect it and not just retreat to your little corner leaving this trail of emails about how you're not the one that needs to lose their job. You need to get leadership and you need to do this sort of stuff so that people understand this is the way that it should work. The next one, demand originality. The difference between good and great is so small. But here's the thing, this is the line that I always use. This used to be an, a poster that hung up in my office. A cover band never changed the world, right? Like if you just wanna go out and copy what somebody else did, have at it, enjoy your mediocrity. Because here's the thing, is that if you wanna walk into my office and tell me that you wanna do you know, our version of another brand's experience, and then everyone's gonna stand around wondering why the word innovation doesn't mean anything in your company, this is why. And this is up to hard decisions and a lot of work and doing a lot of this stuff, but that's it. You don't want to be a cover band, great. You're going to be like the little midget kiss guys of the creative world. And if that's what you want, have at it, but I think most of us don't. Build self-awareness. 
you need to understand that everyone has ideas differently. The worst bosses in the world are the one that thinks everybody needs to operate the way that they do. It's fascist, it's boring, it's not the way things work. You need to understand that everyone has different ways of having ideas. You need to value that, you need to invest in it. You need to say that, that we're going to embrace this because creativity is a team sport. This is what makes us so good and so powerful. Be a failure. This sounds so contrary to so many people. But here is the thing that I've learned the hard way. I've been incredibly lucky to have launched in multiple industries some of the most innovative, like redefining things that have been in that industry. But here is the thing why. If you are not prepared to fail, you will never do anything original. This fear of it having to be right, this fear of the fact that like, oh, we have to do this perfectly. This is why I use methods like design thinking, because you need to fail fast. I need to fail at a low, kind of like easy place. But this also has to become the cultural norm, is that failure is okay. Because what happens in most companies is that you go through, you have to have the one right answer. We're gonna go work on that. But then the problem is, by the time we've designed it, we've invested in it, we've started to build it, there is too much time, political capital, and budget that have been spent on all of those things for us to ever admit anything besides the fact that we know this is gonna be a piece of shit, but at this point, we need to launch it anyway. Again, you wanna know what the secret sauce of companies like Apple and Google and things like that are? There is a brutal quest to fail. There's a brutal, relentless look at how do they do things better, and that that's the reality for that. And then here's the last one, and this is the one that I believe is the most, is about the word crazy. And I've tried to demystify and defang this word for a lot of years. Because here's the thing, you wanna be normal, everybody wants to be normal. Normal's boring. Stupid, a lot of people stup or stupid people are successful. A painful amount of stupid people are successful. They're successful because they don't care, they don't have fear. Those of us who are talented, who are thoughtful, we're afraid of things. But crazy, crazy changes the damn world. And that's why I invest in this word so much. And so I wanna talk about that for just a minute. But here's the thing is whenever you wanna do something different, you wanna come into a company, you wanna come into a bank, you wanna come into a hotel company, you wanna start doing it is what I'm doing. Whenever you come in, the word crazy gets used a lot. They make fun of you. I always say whenever I come into a company, I'm prepared to be hated for at least the first year and a half, and that's fine. Because in most companies, what you do is you just float around, you go with the status quo, I'm gonna do whatever my boss says, like, right? Like, that's what we're gonna do. Because the problem is, is that crazy says, this is what I stand for. And when you stand for something, that means people can make fun of you. They can judge you on it. They can do a lot of things that are really uncomfortable. But here's the thing that I'm gonna tell you about why this is so incredibly important. Because whenever you take up crazy, whenever you decide that that's what you wanna do, the thing that's going to happen is that pretty soon, those same people who made fun of you aren't going to be able to work without you. Because it's like Braveheart, right? Like the first guy that runs up the hill and then everybody else is like, ah, and like runs up after him. You prove that it can be done. And that all of a sudden where they lack the ability to do this, because here's the thing that I will tell you without doubt, is that what is holding your company back is that comfort is the enemy of greatness. Because people will do what it is that they understand. They will do the same thing over and over again, even if they know that it's wrong, because they, and they know it, because they're comfortable with it. The ability to get comfortable being uncomfortable, that is the key. And so, look, at the end of this, you've got a choice. I go into any organization, I go into my own work. You're gonna come here, you're gonna meet a ton of people, you're gonna take a ton of notes. I've traveled all over the world and I've seen this time and time again, and people come up to me afterwards really, really excited. This is so great, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna change everything. There's a funny fork in the road here. Because whenever you go back, you're gonna do one of two things. You're either gonna get ma busy making changes or you're gonna get busy making excuses. Which one is it gonna be? And what are you prepared to do to make sure that the changes outnumber the excuses? Because that's the thing, is that that same person I saw a year ago, the same person who was so excited about that stuff, the year after that I see them slinking out the back of the room. But so here's the thing. None of what I told you guys here was rocket science. None of it was. It's that you need to find this discipline and the belief. Because you know all this stuff. Nothing I said is something that you were like, wow, I've never heard that before. You know all of what this is. But look, success is a choice. And what are the choices that you're gonna make whenever you leave here to be able to do something to make somebody call you crazy? And so with that, if you're interested, I've got 62 episodes of this, of the crazy one. It is an absolute passion project of mine. 
At Envision, we invest a ton into the design community with designbetter.co, with the Design Genome Project that looks at how the greatest companies in the world do these things. A uh, shameless self-promotion, my best friend who did that crazy one tattoo is here, Luke Westman. He is a session on building a personal brand tomorrow at 1320 on the talent stage. I will be in the front row, go check it out. And with that, I'm hiring. So I'm looking for people in Europe to lead my design team. If you think that's you, come find me afterwards. My name's Steve Gates, that's my time. Stay crazy.